How pH affects fermentation. Today on City Studying Unpasteurized. Now, this is a very deep topic that you can go down a lot of rabbit holes with. So we're gonna keep it on the simpler side and go with things that are direct effects that basically good guidelines that everybody should know. There's gonna be a lot more that we're not gonna talk about today, but if anybody had questions on that, ask in the comments below and we'll be happy to take a look at that and see if it's something that we wanna bring onto the show. But for today, Derica did the research, so I'm gonna let her start. I actually uh, researched many different scientific um, articles about pH and fermentation, and that included the full range of fermentation, even beyond alcohol creation. So I try to minimize the collection of information to what is applicable here, but it goes so far and beyond. Yeah. And that's because if you think about pH, uh, the acidity or the alkalinity of a liquid, anything living in that liquid is going to be affected by that pH. Think of an mm -hmm. aquarium, right? Fish, uh, crustaceans, they all have their specific pH range where they're going to thrive or die. Yeah. And this is sense. something that occurs within your little microorganism, aka your brew, right? It's yeah. alive. You Technically, know that, right? Technically, it's kind of like a its own biome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So pH affects different things in different ways. And I'm gonna cover two specific things. One, yeast, which is something that we really need to be considering. And another thing is just the proteins or the contents of your brew because pH affects that as well. Which affects aging, right? It affects everything. All right, well, we'll get to it. Everything. So. Let's start off with yeast. Yeast prefer a pH of different levels for different stages of development. And this is something I actually didn't know. I just thought pH for yeast is a, a set number right. and that it may, may be slightly different depending on the yeast strain. And that is not true. Well, it is true because there is a slight, like they, they all, different strains prefer different ranges. But what she's saying that's not true is that a constant pH a set, is yeah. not necessarily appropriate all the time. Right. And it doesn't stay that way anyway. Right. So in general, and in my notes, I, I underlined in general because generalities are generally, generally wrong. <laughs> so take all this as a grain of salt. For, with a grain of salt because the numbers are not going to be exactly applicable across the board. But in general, yeah. when the yeasts are multiplying, when they're creating their colony, they're building up their colony, which is the, the very, very beginning, beginning of fermentation, they prefer a pH higher than 5.0. I've actually heard that before, but... But there's a caveat to that. It's not just yeast, but any microorganisms. Yeah. So there's some bad guys in there that prefer that that higher number in pH, such as... We've mentioned it before, and I don't like to scare people with it, but it is something to be aware of. Botulism spores can live in honey, and they cannot live below 4.6 pH, but they do live and thrive and grow past 4.6 pH. So you want to temper that idea that the colony is going to build best over 5.0 with the idea that, well... What else is growing? Yeah, other things can grow in there too. Because I, I, I want to say like bacteria and mold and things like that can all grow in that higher, higher pH range. Yeah, and in my deep dive, I found a long laundry list of different things and how they're effective differently right. and what their optimal pH is and all that. Uh, so I, w I wanted to... to to bring it back down here and not get too crazy and just focus on the yeast, but have that caveat to let you know that there are other things that could potentially grow in your brew that you do not want. So keep that in mind. An interesting side effect of this too, just going through it in my head, is a product that we only recently started using. Um, Go Firm? Go Firm. I couldn't think of the name of it. I want to say Firm something. <laughs> but it's GoFirm. And GoFirm gives vitamins and nutrients to a yeast at the start when they're building their colony. And I like this product because if you think about it, if yeast do their best at building a colony past 5.0 pH, we are essentially weakening them slightly by using below five. 
but by giving them some go firm, we're giving them a little bit of a boost, just a little bit of an extra chance. So we're kind of, hopefully, maybe, balancing out Perfect. that lowering of pH. And giving them with a giving them, Yeah, with giving them a little <laughs> bit more to work with. So I like that concept, and I think that's a great idea. Um, I actually like using go firm more than I like using Firmado, just because of that concept. So that is just in the yeast's growth stage. But once they're done growing and they're getting ready to ferment, they actually want the pH to be lower than 5.0. They're kind of picky little things, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they, they have some some needs. They have, they have some needs, don't but, we all? <laughs> but, but here's the thing. The actual procedure for creating alcohol is an acidifying process. So they're naturally lowering their own pH, aren't they? So... I started I to ahead. dig a little bit deeper and I found out some more information about the actual structure and how uh, the elements that are in your must get affected by pH that are going to help that's, yeast That's a couple of paragraphs ferment. away. <clears throat> All right, here. so <laughs> I already did that. You didn't do this one. Oh, right. Okay. So they ferment most efficiently at a pH lower than five, yep. but they stop growth at pH below 2.8. Yeah. So that's why there's there's a very specific range that you want to keep them in. So for the, the upfront, you definitely want it between five and 2.8. And that comes later when we give our suggested pH reading. But there's something that a lot of people don't seem to understand too, and that is that the colony that you start with is not the colony that you end with. Yeast are constantly reproducing. Yeah. If you notice, it said stops growth at 2.8. What that means is if you have a yeast colony that's thriving and your pH drops below 2.8, they're not going to grow anymore. They will still continue to produce alcohol yeah. until they die, yeah. which is only days. Yeah. Yeast, yeast do not live very long. No. They're just a single cell. You know, they don't live very long at all. So you will end up with a stall. Yeah. yeah. Pretty simple. All right, so as Brian already touched, the fermentation process is an acidifying process, meaning that as those yeasts are creating alcohol, they're also creating acids, and therefore they are going to be lowering your pH. But the good news is, as they incrementally lower the pH, that encourages for more fermentation. So yay! To a point. pH also affects the shape and function of proteins, and that's all the stuff that's in your must and how their molecules are formed together. Uh, so this is the part that I did not know anything about. <clears throat> enzymes, for example, are a protein that can speed up chemical reactions. So you have your, your molecule of grape gunk or honey gunk or whatever, and there's all the, the proteins and the enzymes that are binding it together to create their different things. And the pH can morph that structure hmm. uh, depending on whether it's a higher pH or a lower pH. So <clears throat> amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, can either be acidic or basic, which is another thing I didn't think about because it's amino acids. They should all be acidic, right? So forget that name. Well, it might be relatively acidic or relatively basic. Sure. Yeah. But it depends on, on their type, oh. uh, whether they're acidic or basic. And then when the pH level increases, meaning it goes more basic, the bonds of or the alkaline. proteins are changed that make the fermentation process more difficult. So pretend like this is, a, I have a, a ball, right? And that is my my molecule. And if it if the pH is too high, that is going to kind of bend in a direction. I'm going up. I don't know which way it bends. It doesn't could really matter to me. It could be it could inside be backwards. Out. Who knows? Uh, but what, whichever way it, it bends, it changes its its structure. It it makes it more resilient towards fermentation. Hmm. Where if the pH is lower or more acidic, it's going to bend in the opposite direction, making it more easy to ferment. Interesting. That's why they like a higher in the beginning and a lower as it starts fermenting. Yeah. That makes sense. So if you take all this information together about how the fermentation process is aided by changing the structure of what you're trying to ferment by being at a lower pH, and that yeasts are more readily available to be happy to ferment at a lower pH, but you want to have a high enough pH that they can grow before they get started, then that comes up, dun, 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 
to the magical pH number of four, which... Where does that sound familiar hmm, from? Hmm. It sounds very similar to what we recommend as the optimal pH level. Yep. Yay! Now, according to this, though, you could start at like 4.5 or so, yeah. and it'll work its way down to four anyway. Right, right. Yeah. So that might even be slightly better, but you're safe right. at four, as we've shown time and right. time again. And botulism is just one of the microorganisms that yeah, there's a lot. are available. There are so many. And when I was researching this, I'm like, there is no way I can list off the different pH ranges for all this stuff. Lots of nasty bugs. People are just going to be like, what? Um, and that's why I narrowed it down and con condensed this topic as much as I possibly could mm -hmm. to what do the yeast like and how does it affect what's potentially in your must? Those are the two things that we really need to consider as far as pH goes. Now, we know that changing the pH incrementally as, as the fermentation process is going to do, it's not going to like drastically change the pH all at once. It's just going to do, slowly, do, slowly yeah. bring it down. The yeast are adapted to that environment. And yeah. so they're not going to be affected by it. Kind of like the frog in the pot that uh, starts out cold and they sure. bring it up to boiling. They adapt to so it as it goes. So they're not going to get stressed out. Whereas if you are like mothering your beverage and like, oh no, the pH went there. And you and throw you a bunch of chemicals yep. in there. The yeast are not going to know what to do with that. And that's that's probably going to be more detrimental than helpful. Right. So it's it's okay to to watch and, and and recognize what's occurring. But as long as you start off in an optimal range for your yeast, you're probably just gonna wanna let it do its thing. Uh, the only thing I could say where that wouldn't be the case, if for some reason you, you wanted to change the flavor profile and add something acidic like a citrus. That's different though. <clears throat> but you did it for some reason while it's still fermenting, I wouldn't uh, recommend yeah, doing that. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I, I would say save those flavor adjustments till after fermentation yeah, is all done. that's something I wanted to talk about. And that way you won't have to worry about harming your yeast. Which brings up a very interesting question that actually came up recently. We make pH adjustments when we're creating the brew, okay? We make acidity adjustments when we're taste testing the brew, okay? Flavor adjustments. There's a distinct difference. We make a pH adjustment in the beginning for the yeast's sake so that they can work their best. We make a flavor adjustment using acidity at the end for our sakes, for taste. That has zero effect on the fermentation because the fermentation is done by the time we do that. Someone asked, it's too low, should I raise my pH when it was finished brewing? And they, I don't think they understood, and it, I never thought of it that way, but it makes perfect sense that somebody would misconstrue and not understand that at the end, lower pH is a good thing, okay? And it, another thing that, that makes it be a lower thing at the end is remember all those microorganisms that are enjoying the higher pH? Remember those organisms? Here's our organism. Her name is Tigger. She's very loud. She needs her daddy. She wouldn't shut up, so... Yeah. All right. So if we have a lower pH at the very end, then those bad microorganisms that we don't want in our brew are not going to be able to thrive or get a hand on our brew because the pH is too low. So if you think about many commercial wineries in particular will stabilize their wine by adding something acidic to lower the pH. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for storage and preservation. Yep. It makes perfect sense. Yep. Because that's what spoils a wine or mead anyway, is something infecting it, whether it's wild yeast or a bacteria or, you know, any number of things. Right. So that's where a low pH is a good thing at the end. Plus, it makes it taste a little bit better. It gives yep. a little, like, brightness and sharpness to the flavor. Yep. We usually find that over the course of aging, that sharpness changes, too. So even yes. though the pH may not, the values of it on your palate actually do change. And now we know a little bit more about why aged brews continue to change mm -hmm. because the molecules themselves have changed their shape and they may doing, be doing more things as they continue to sit in the brew. You know, the more you know. It just, it, it's kind of amazing. The, it is. 
It was there's, really, it was really fascinating. I was kind of nerding out about it. I'm like, no, focus. There's focus. kind of a Dooning Kruger effect <laughs> going on with any topic that you get into. You know, when you first start, you go, oh, I watched five videos, I read three books, I know everything there is to know, and then you start realizing how much you didn't know. There's more that you didn't know than what you know now, even though yesterday you knew less than you know today. And then you learn that stuff that you think you, you didn't know before, and now you know all this stuff. And then you realize there's a million times more that I don't know. It's constantly that way. We've been doing this for over a decade easily, longer, and <laughs> there's still so many little things. The trick is knowing what to use, when to use it, and how to apply it. And I mean, not just products and ingredients, I mean the knowledge. There's times that this is important and there's times that it isn't because I can sum up all these notes in one line. Target pH of 4.0 to start, done. <laughs> and that's what we do in our videos yeah. because we like to keep it as simple as possible so that we can teach that. But knowing all this, you can experiment a little, you can play a little, because that's what's important there is knowing why and how, not just do this thing and make this thing. I, I hate that. I'd rather teach you to fish than give you a fish. For those of you who enjoy reading scientific journals, I'll make sure that I link some of the ones that I referenced in the description below, so that way you can read all about all the craziness of pH and what it entails. I would say a caveat to that is do not get overwhelmed. Do not yeah. feel like you have to micromanage your no, bruise. No, you don't. That is not how the process works. Kiss method. As long as you have that optimal starting pH range, then the yeast will take care of lowering the pH by naturally doing the fermentation process. It all goes along with this line that I have not said in a very long time. Mead wants to make itself. We just have to stay out of the way. So as long as you give it a good starting point, just sit back and let it do its thing. It's a natural process. It'll happen. I think that's all we got to say on that's pH, it. right? As always, guys, thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>